Welcome to Growing Up Beverly Hills. I'm Stacy, And I'm David. We grew up together in Beverly Hills in the 1980s. Forget what you've seen in the movies or TV shows. We have the real stories about real people growing up in Beverly Hills. Here's a little known fact for you. There aren't any talking chihuahuas. <laughs> Beverly Hills folk drop a lot of names of people and places. We just can't help it. Don't worry, we'll explain it all at the end of the interview in the Beverly Hills Breakdown. Enjoy, subscribe, and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Hi, Stacy. Hey, David. We had the privilege of meeting and talking to Stacy Margolin Potter. We sure did. Stacy started playing tennis at a young age. She turned pro after two years at USC. Thanks to Title IX, she was able to become the number one player on the boys' team at Beverly High. Pretty amazing. Her father would make her breakfast and drive her to school and take her to tournaments. She was so lucky to spend all the time with him since he unfortunately died when she was 18 years old. Stacy was just embarking on her pro career. She went on to compete in 25 majors and squeezed in a romance with John McEnroe. After retiring from tennis, she went back to her education and earned a master's in psychology. She's lived in Ojai now for many years with her husband and is thriving in so many areas. She was so interesting to talk to, so please enjoy. Enjoy. Stacey Margolin Potter, welcome to Growing Up Beverly Hills. Thank you. We're really interested to hear about your whole life, and it started in Beverly Hills. It did. What is the when and why of why your family came to Beverly Hills in the first place? Well, my parents were living in Los Angeles, and I believe the story went that my mom always wanted to live in Beverly Hills. I was born in the house that I grew up in. My brother, who's six years older, he was born in Portland, Oregon, oh. and uh, I have an older sister as well. So they were they were living in Oregon for a while, and I guess the winters were quite harsh and everything, so... They decided to move to uh, Los Angeles and specifically Beverly Hills. And they knew that the school system was really good. So my brother, you know, went to Beverly Vista. I went to Beverly Vista. All of us went to Beverly Hills High. I think their original house on South Rodeo Drive, they got for $43,000 or something like that. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Our Stacy went to Beverly Vista, too. I went to Beverly Vista, too. Yeah. I was on Elm Drive, just right by the school, right above Olympic. Yes, I remember Elm. Yeah. So you started from the very, very beginning. Very beginning. There was a a few of us kids on South Rodeo. I mean, in those days, I didn't know, oh, Rodeo Drive, famous street. I was, you know, South Rodeo was a very modest neighborhood. You know, the kids rode their bikes in the streets. We threw footballs. Uh, we walked everywhere, biked everywhere. So we had a little walking group that went to Beverly Vista. And then it turned into a couple, you know, a few of us were then biked to Beverly Vista. And then when I got to high school, for the most part, my dad drove me. That was sort of our oh. little routine is my dad would wake me up, make me breakfast. And for the most part, I would get driven to school. Sometimes I would bike or walk, but most of the time, like, he would drop me off before his work. And, yeah, that was uh, because we were only, you know, a couple miles away from the high school. Not very far from the high school. Very close. So you started tennis at a very early age. Yeah, started at around seven. I remember taking a group class at Beverly Hills High, probably through uh, the rec department, whichever one it was, like Roxbury or something like that. And yeah, started at seven and then played on the weekends with my dad. And then my brother and my dad also played at Rancho Park in Chevy Hills. So then I started following them, you know, when I was eight or nine. And then at 10, after just watching them play on the courts and me hitting against the backboard, my dad finally put me in lessons with the local pro at Rancho Park. Okay. Did your dad start the passion for tennis in your family? Yeah, we were wondering, is it your dad, your brother? Who brought it to you guys? Actually, even though my mom didn't play, she was of the mindset like, hey, let's get the family involved in something, something we could all do, and let's do tennis. She wasn't very good or anything, but my (laughs) dad was such a student of the game and loved the history of it, followed all the famous players, 
during that day and the previous years, you know, he was just a big historian about tennis and actually bought a book by Pancho Gonzalez and self-taught himself. Wow. How old was he when he did that? I mean, not young. I mean, because he was an older dad. So I want to say like in his like 40 or something. Wow. Your dad and your brother were learning at the same time? My brother and my, and actually my older sister took lessons. My sister didn't take to tennis at all. The story has it too that my dad might have played a little bit in college. Okay. So hmm. he went to Berkeley. Yeah. So it was basically my dad and I and my brother that played. What was your dad's profession? He was an insurance salesman. Oh, wow. Life insurance. So he, he was traveling a lot, like in his car. That was in the days they would like hit the pavement, knock on doors, you know. Right. He had done it in Oregon. And then there was a company out here. I think it was charter insurance. So he did that. That was the only job that I knew that he had. Oh, wow. He died young. I, well, I was young. I was 18. He was 56. Oh, oh wow. no, 58. So oh. he, was, he was a young guy. Yeah. yeah. For sure. But was a fabulous player, considering he was self-taught. He had perfect strokes. He was very dedicated with me. You know, would get out the basket of balls. We'd go to the high school. We'd go to the parks on the weekend. And was just very into it with me. Would take me to the tournaments because my mom had a horrible sense of direction. <laughs> if she took us to the tournaments, we would get lost. And you'd be late. <laughs> yeah, and I'd be late for the tournament and I'd end up like in, you know, some god awful town. Yeah. <laughs> Don't default me. I'm, I'm going to be late <laughs> and I'll be there, you know. But I'm on my way. <laughs> yeah. So my dad was the one that took us everywhere and being an insurance salesman and sometimes having to go out of town, he had the Thomas guide and he just, you know, he knew all of LA and beyond. Yeah. Your dad had the tennis passion and your brother too, but did your brother compete on the level that you did? He competed um, all throughout junior tennis. He went on to USC and played on the team and it was very, very competitive when he went. Um, he was in the day of like Jimmy Connors, who was mm. at UCLA at the same time. I think Jimmy was like a year younger than my brother or two. And so it was very competitive, mm -hmm. but didn't go on to any professional sort of play. He did play maybe one or two local pro tournaments, like at the Los Angeles Tennis Club called the Pacific Southwest, uh -huh. and got to play in the qualifying round there. And then we did get to play, though, in the U.S. Open a few times in mixed doubles. Oh, wow. How cool is that? Yeah, we did win the Southern California Open Championship, sectionals championship. That's cool. How much older was he than you? Six years older. Oh, wow. So he played with me too. Once my dad passed away, then he sort of took on the role of my coach dad. Okay. And was out there on the courts with me. Didn't do a lot of traveling because he was a pro at the Los Angeles Tennis Club mm -hmm. uh, where Margo used to yep. play. And uh, so he coached a lot of the juniors there. And then, so he only got to go to like maybe two tournaments a year, like maybe the U.S. Open and one other tournament. A lot of people would think a tennis player from Beverly Hills uh, grew up with a tennis court in their backyard and belonged to a country club, but that wasn't your upbringing. Not at all. Not at all. And in fact, you know, because I did so much traveling and I would stay with different families at tournaments and they would say, where are you from? And so at first, you know, I'd say Beverly Hills and they'd say just what you said. Oh, you have a tennis court, a swimming pool. I'm like, no, no, I don't belong to a country club. We're just pretty modest, moderate lifestyle. Regular people. <laughs> Regular people. We play at the park and you get to have a certain reputation being from Beverly Hills, like rich, spoiled brat or something. And so I would just start saying Los Angeles, you know? Yeah. And then even when I was on the pros, I would say that. But if they did find out I was from Beverly Hills, the comment I did get, which was a compliment, um, was, oh, you're so down to earth. You know, <laughs> yeah, right. Like we were all snooty patooties or something. <laughs> uh, you know, handing out you know hundred dollar bills to people or something. Exactly. But hanging out with with all the stars. 
Yeah, I mean, because I was raised, you know, with good values, good, you know, discipline, and um, we were just a regular family. I mean, in my mind, tennis was kind of an elite sport where either the kids played from five years old, hardcore, they maybe they homeschooled and really just had no socialize and played tennis. You sounded like you grew up very well rounded where you had a, a school life, you played at the parks. And then when I guess when you got really around the age 10, went hardcore. And how did your life change when it really focused on tennis itself? Good question there. I did miss out on some things. I was, so it was focused around the tournaments. And my dad, like I said, was quite the disciplinarian. So if I did get invited to a party or sleepover, it was like, well, honey, you have a tournament tomorrow. You have to get a good night's sleep. And I'd go, oh, okay. You know, and so I didn't, realize I was missing out on stuff or the ski trips in high school mm -hmm. or even, you know, grammar school. Maybe we got lucky enough to do something like that. But it was from the age of 10, it was tournaments every weekend. So that was my weekend. Yeah. When did everybody know that you were something special? Well, I guess there were the local papers, you know, what was it? The Beverly Hills Courier and the Independent and so when I started winning some of the, the Los Angeles tournaments, you know, I would get in the paper. And so that was around 11 and 12, I guess. Yeah. And when I was 12 is when I first got ranked number six in Southern California. Wow. I didn't become number one in Southern Cal until I was 16. Wow. There was a lot of good players in Southern California. In the juniors, when I started competing nationally at age 14 and got to go to the nationals, I mean, if you were from California, that was a huge deal as well as if you were from Florida. So the Sunshine State really mm -hmm. had the, the really good players. So you could be, you know, number one in the Middle Eastern section or something, and then you play a California girl, and they beat the pants off of them, you know? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering something. If your father and your brother had played a different sport, let's say something like golf, do you think you would have become a professional golfer? <laughs> what if, what if? I mean... <laughs> Was it you had a, a natural ability for sports or a natural ability for tennis? Or do you think you could have played any sport? That's, again, a good question. I just, you know, tennis, I did take to. I guess I learned it quickly. I had good instruction from the beginning. There was somebody at, at Hillcrest Country Club who I did take from named Carl Earn. Oh, I know Carl. Yeah, very famous teacher. He was a left-handed and so that's why my mom wanted me to take from him. And my brother had taken from him because my brother was left-handed. Oh. But I also took from a guy, uh, a very well-known uh, instructor named Bob Harmon. Yeah. Who wrote books about tennis. And he coached, I think, Stan Smith and Mo Connolly. And when we say coached, I mean, he taught half-hour lessons. You know, that's right. what it was in those days. And so at one point when I was about... 13, 14, 15, I was taking actually a half hour from Carl and a half hour from Bob Harmon. And I remember changing clothes in the back of the car, you know, <laughs> my tennis gear so I could then jump out of the car and go have my lesson. I took the tennis, A, because I was small and I was fast. Yeah. And whether or not my dad instilled it or I just had it, but there was this competitiveness that just drove me to want to win. And winning's fun. <laughs> so <laughs> I would win, you know, quite a bit. And then, like I said, as I got older, you know, 15, 16, 17, I started winning more. And so that's what I got used to. Mm. Yeah. Did the kids at BV know that you were a tennis player? Yeah, I think so. Probably in seventh and eighth grade. Because you missed the bar mitzvah years. Right. There was a couple of kids that I knew in school that played and we would, you know, go to Rancho Park. There was a couple of boys that I played with. And I think I was, you know, kind of made fun of a little bit because I wasn't in the nerd crowd. I wasn't in the, I, I was kind of like in a blend of crowds, but yeah. I surely wasn't in, you know, the kids that were starting to do drugs in seventh and eighth grade. I surely wasn't in that crowd. And I remember them sort of making fun of me a little bit as yeah. I got from like eighth to ninth grade, like, Oh, you know, Stacy can't go and do that because she's got to go play tennis or, you know, right, and I thought, right. I just didn't understand that. I'm like, why are they making fun of that? You know, I didn't, I didn't quite get it. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. There were definitely some gals and guys that I was friends with in grammar school. But then by the time I got to high school, I was definitely in that mode of tennis. And then they were in the mode of like maybe doing drugs and hanging out. Drugs and rock and roll. (laughs) Parties and and doing all that. And so I, you know, I even probably kind of split with a couple of friends, you know, because of that. Uh, Yeah, sure. I got other friends because of sports, you know, so then I had friends that were volleyball players and water yeah. players and tennis players. And you were on the athletic path while the yeah. others were on God only knows whatever path they turned out to be. <laughs> so when you arrived at the high school, I assume the tennis team knew about you and you were kind of automatically number one on the women's team. I'm trying to jog my memory. I must have tried out for the team, but I remember my dad also saying, well, hey, why don't you try out for the boys team? And this was in 1973. And there was Title IX, which said, you know, that a girl could play on any team. So I went out for the boys team. And I do remember trying out and got on the team. And so I just didn't even play on the girls team. I remember the girls coach, Sue Stevens, being a little upset. A little bummed. (laughs) A little bummed. (laughs) And she didn't really give me the cold shoulder, but I could tell her feathers were ruffled, you know, that I was choosing the boys team. As a freshman, first of all, you're playing on the boys team. Not only on the boys team, but number one. I wasn't number one my freshman year. Oh, okay. And then there was another gal, Diane Morrison, who lived in Los Angeles, but got to play at, at Beverly. So I was the first freshman. Were you both the first women on the men's team, the boys' team? And that's all because of Title IX. Yes. They couldn't say no. So Title IX was this huge benefit that must have made your game so much better. Yeah. Quick question. What did these other guys that you're playing at other schools think when you were kicking their ass? Like, what was that like to these high school boys' ego? Well, I'll tell you, it didn't go over great even on the team that I was on. Yeah, I'm sure because I was taking one of their spots. Right. So I remember I even got teased. I won't mention names. Okay. Well, like there was this guy from Sam High, Santa Monica High School, and yep. he was about 6'5", I swear to God. Wow. I mean, he was a tall, skinny dude. His name was um, Jamie Wilson. Oh, God. And I was about 5'2", when I was a freshman. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. I, made, I barely made it to 5'4 when I graduated. So let's say I was 5'3 okay. you know, when I played him. And he had a huge serve. And in those days, it was you played four sets. So you were, say, I played number one, but I played the number two, number three, number four, and you rotated. Right. So he was number one. I was number one. I beat him in a set. And as, as long as I could get the serve back and we got into a rally, then I would win the point. So I remember coming up to net and shaking his hand and just like looking, you know, <laughs> way up. And he barely, you know, shook my hand and he was not happy. Oh. But it was quite an experience because, you know, here's I'm, I'm the only girl and maybe Diane didn't come in until her junior year. I, I you'd have to look the uh, in the in the watchtower yearbooks when, okay. when Diane played. You dated Rocky Lang and his father was Jennings Lang, right? Yes. And his mom was Monica Lewis, who was a famous singer. Mm. Rocky was just the sweetest. And um, he was like a year older than us. So he already had a car <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> and I remember him trying to teach me stick shift on his Audi. But that's how we got to, you know, get around is Rocky had a car. And, uh, you know, he we just had a good time. It was sort of a little bit of an off and on romance. Uh, we might have broken up for a period of time somewhere in the middle of high school and then got back together. And then when we graduated, you know, then things changed because I was out on the circuit more. And yeah, you went your way. Again, you, even in high school, it sounds like you had time to go to school and have a boyfriend and have a life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I did have, yeah. And my parents were actually okay with that. They really loved Rocky. That's good. Rocky did have a court. So we had lots of fun. We would actually go sometimes after school and practice on his court. So Rocky was a good practice partner. And then on the weekends, Rocky's dad was really into tennis and really into these social parties on the weekend where you would play tennis, have lunch, sit around the pool. Nice. Beautiful house. 
And so sometimes Rocky's dad would put, hit me or put me against these players and not tell them, you know, my tennis background. And meanwhile, <laughs> there was betting going on on the side that I didn't know about. So, yeah, so Mr. Lang was making money off me as I was beating up on his friends. And were those friends celebrities? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you remember a celebrity that you crushed back then? Oh, God, you'd have to ask Rocky. But I mean, <laughs> he also had these movie showings and the people would come and watch the movie. So there, it might have been like Charlton Heston, it, uh, other actors that I, I'm just sort of blanking on right now. But very, very fun, nice people. Jennings Lang was kind of the king of disaster films. He made the earthquake films and the airport films. Exactly. So we got to see Airport, Earthquake, Poseidon Adventure, all those. Oh, and he had a full on, you know, big movie screen uh, room. So we got to see them. And, and you know, you remember the noise of, of those movies and everything. It was really incredible. You know, they always had a, a huge cast of actors. Yeah. At high school, did you realize that you wanted to go pro? At some point? I didn't think about it. I mean, my dad would take me to some of the pro tournaments, uh, I think when I was 16, and we'd go, uh, we went to Mission Hills one time, and we were watching Chris Everett, and he's like, that's that's how I want you to play, you know, and I want you to act on the court, and, and but he also loved Billie Jean King, mm-hmm. um, and he loved Yvonne Goolagong, and so there was all these just fabulous players. It wasn't until I was 17 that I actually entered a pro tournament sort of on a whim Mm. in Portland, Oregon, and flew up there by myself. And how did you do in your first tournament? In my first tournament, I went through a few rounds of pre-qualifying, another few rounds of qualifying, and then made it all the way to the finals. So I made it nine rounds, and Tracy Austin was 14. I Mm -hmm. was 17, and I think we might have flown up to the tournament together. Before I knew it, I was in the finals. In your first tournament? Wow. First pro tournament, and I remember saying to my mom, like, well, do you guys want to fly up for the finals, you know? <laughs> I think my brother and my mom came to that, and it was, I mean, I had so much wear and tear on my feet. You know, I had never played that many matches. I mean, I lost the first set, but then I won the second set against wow. Tracy. And again, here we were, both amateurs, and then in the somewhere in the third set, it was like, two one or three one i just got up from my chair on the changeover and i literally like couldn't take a step i mean they were just on fire and so i had to default or what they call retire from the match but what an amazing first one that's incredible so every class at beverly has their share of famous kids and people whose parents are famous but uh, you went to school with somebody who's been in the news a lot lately, and that's Alejandro Mayorkas, and that's Biden's nominee for the head of Homeland Security. Otherwise known as Ali to just us. Uh, he was a, a great sport and, and fella and had a wicked sense of humor and small like myself. I mean, he wasn't like a big guy or anything, but just one of those guys that you love to have on your team, you know, just an all around good guy obviously smart. Uh-huh. One of those kids that just got along with everybody. Was he good at tennis? Yeah, he was on the varsity team and he was good friends with Rocky. Oh, wow. So a lot of the guys on our team were friends with one another. It was a very kind of tight knit team. And to this day, I mean, I'm still friends with Rocky. Rocky's still friends with Allie. Allie's still friends with, you know, Steve Ritchie. I mean, there's, there's a lot of us that are still somewhat in touch with one another. We always say you make a lot of lifetime friendships at Beverly. Yeah, yeah. It's it's true. I mean, that's how David and I are friends. (laughs) That's so great. Do you feel like the country's in good hands with with Allie? I do. I mean, he's he's got a good head on his shoulders, and I think he's going to see us right. Well, we're very thrilled to have a Beverly Hills alumni taking care of our country for sure. For sure. After high school, you went off to USC. Was that a dream to go to USC? Because I know that you have a legacy of USC in your family. Not quite the legacy. Talk about, you know, I think I was destined to go there because uh, I heard about SC. Obviously, my brother went there, but my mother went there and Mm. my uncle went there. Wow. So my mom, supposedly she told me she finished college in either 
in three years or something. I think she just went all the way straight through or something. Sure. So USC is not far from your child at home. Did you live at home or did you live on campus with your teammates? Yeah. Well, the first year I lived in the dorms and uh, I roomed with a volleyball player, a really excellent volleyball player. However, so I went to school in September. It was that July, right before college, that my dad passed away. Oh. oh. Here I was on the exciting journey of starting college and getting to live, you know, on campus for the first yeah. time dorm and experience the dorm experience. But then um, I felt sort of this pull or this tug or guilt about my mom yeah. and what she was going through being a, you know, a young woman of 52, losing her husband. And mm-hmm. so the second year I moved home. And so then I, I commuted because in those days when there wasn't any traffic, it was a 20 minute commute down the, sure. you know, 10 East. So um, that's, that's what I did my second year. And you won the singles title your first year and the team title your second year. Exactly. And that wow. was a goal of mine to win the individual's Win a win a team title and also to get into the top fifty in the world on the on the main tour. Um, after a good run at the U.S. Open, I won my first pro tournament in San Antonio, Texas. Wow! And which is where I won my national title. So I wow. have this little affinity for a little for fondness of Texas, San Antonio, <laughs> San Antonio specifically. So, and I remember coming back um, into my second year. And within a few short months, there was this article written on me in the L.A. Um, sports section. And there I was on the front. And I didn't see the article right away, but one of my teammates did. And she, from the article, I guess the rankings had just come out right around that time. And she said, Stace, have you seen the rankings? And I said, no. And she said, well, go have a look. You know, and I was, that's when I saw I was 18. Wow. Well, and this, you know, because I played at maybe five or six tournaments in my freshman year. Wow. Traveling to tournaments while I was still in school. That was quite a, a jump for me, you know. That's huge. What a yeah. huge jump. Did you feel like you were missing out on kind of the normal college experience at that time? No, because I would just go for a, a week and then come back. And then you left after your sophomore year. Yeah, yeah. So um, I did... Uh, turn pro after we won the team nationals uh in june and then a bunch of us went over to play wimbledon in july wow. and that, that was my first sort of official um run was in england uh turning pro what was that like playing wimbledon how old were you 20 years old and that, so i was 20 when i turned pro but i'd actually played wimbledon when i was 19 so let's go back to 19. How was that? That would be so cool. Because when I was 18, I was playing at the Maccabea Games. That was in Israel. You went to the, in Israel, you went to the Maccabee Games? Yeah, that was a huge, huge honor and loved, loved the experience. Again, it was a mixed blessing because that was when my dad passed away. <laughs> I know. Was while, while I was in Israel. Mm. You know, when they say you have a premonition or a funny feeling, mm-hmm. I woke up in, in Tel Aviv. I remember we were staying at what they call like an Olympic village with some of the other players and nobody was in my room wow. uh, when I woke up and it was just this very eerie feeling. And I thought, what's going on? And I had had a dream that he had, that he was saying goodbye. No way. It was, uh, and I remember calling, I think in those days, you know, the phones, <laughs> I don't know how I somehow was able to call home. Yeah. Uh, but she told me everything was okay. She didn't tell me. Your mom didn't tell you. Yeah. Because yeah. so, you, your head wouldn't have been able to probably com- finish yeah, the competition. Yeah. Well, that's what she thought, I guess. And But I, I did end up playing the finals and uh, then came home. And then I remember asking her, did he pass away on a Wednesday? And she said, oh, yeah, Ma, I got chills. I have chills. Yeah, that was the morning that I woke up and I said, something's not right. Wow. Yeah. So, but it was, again, it was a super exciting experience walking into this huge stadium, you know, with all of your different kinds of teammates from all the different sports and winning a, a gold medal in mixed doubles. I played with Peter Renner. Wow. Uh, got to the semifinals of the women's doubles and then lost in the finals of the singles to Dana Gilbert. 
mm. um, who was a great player in her own right, but it was somebody that I had never lost to before. And so I, during that finals, I didn't feel right. Like so mm. I was like not even in my body. Something mm. was amiss. So that was, uh, that was the Maccabea experience. What and an then amazing. at 19 going to Wimbledon, that trumped every experience I think I'd ever had. Must have. Because dreaming about Wimbledon as a kid, seeing it on TV. I remember pretending that I was at Wimbledon on my grass backyard <laughs> against, the, against the, the wall of the garage and just yeah. pretending that I was at Wimbledon when I was nine or 10 years old. And then to think that nine years later, there I was. And just all this like history, just mm-hmm. all around you, like the vines on the walls and and you could just feel something in the in the air. And wow. and I remember playing my match and I was so I had so much energy going through me that my feet wouldn't stop moving when I when I would sit down on the changeovers. They I was just like I, w- I wouldn't say a nervous wreck, but I just had all this nervous energy. Yeah. It was kind of funny because I was put on late at night, which, you know, in, in Europe in the summer it stays light till nine o'clock or something. Right. And so my match went on at like eight and there was probably five people watching. Oh, wow. (laughs) Wow. That probably took away some of the nerves. Yeah. Yeah. One of which was my mom, John McEnroe, and maybe like three other English people. Gotcha. But I played in a zone. I was like so focused. I didn't know if there was five or 500 people watching. And I finished my match really quickly and beat an English girl who was, good player in her own right she was i think she was three in england so um her name was ann hobbs and and i won really easily so i was ecstatic that i won my first match at wimbledon watching wimbledon they always seem like they treat the players really well yeah yeah i mean yeah it was you had these locker rooms where there were sort of ladies in waiting you know like if you went into your shower they'd hand you a towel and Everything was very prim, prim and proper, you know. Very fancy yeah. at Wimbledon. I like it. A, a lot of pros in tennis, they stay at somebody's house. Was that true at Wimbledon in some of these big tournaments? No, I, I think when I went with my mom, I stayed in a hotel. And then when I went with my teammates, stayed, we probably, there was probably like five of us sharing a flat or what they yeah. call flat you know, in England, um, in subsequent years, then I was traveling some with John and then he would sort of rent a big old like apartment or whatever. So now soon after Rocky, you started dating John McEnroe. Yeah. You know, you know how to date him, Stacy. I got to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> how old were you when you met John? Well, I met John originally uh, at a, some junior tournaments. Um, we had both been invited to a tournament uh, in New York called, at Kutcher's Country Club. Oh, I know that. You've heard of it? I, yeah, I used to live in New York. Oh, okay. Right, right, right. So, and then we'd, we'd see each other at other tournaments. But I was still, you know, stating Rocky in high school. And so it wasn't until high school finished and, and that relationship ended with Rocky that then I went and started seeing more of John. That's incredible. I saw some old photos of you and John and you, you guys were like babies. <laughs> oh, yeah. so cute. Yeah. Was that a good time in your life during dating him, playing hardcore tennis? And like, what was that like during that time of your life? It must have been exciting. You know, it was a mixed bag. I mean, John was getting publicity of his own for yeah. not only his tennis, but for his off court behavior. And just zooming up in the rankings and, uh, you know, most of the tournaments were on separate, they were separated. You know, the men had their circuit. I had my, you know, women had their tournaments, men had their, and the only times that you would actually see, uh, the men players would be at the Grand Slam tournaments. So, um, it was a lot of, you know, toing and froing. John was from the East Coast. So if he came out to visit me, he'd come out to Los Angeles couple times I went up to Stanford uh, during our first year in college. He would come down to LA or sometimes we would meet somewhere meet at his house in New York or wherever he was practicing. Could you tell how talented he was at a young age? Oh yeah. I mean, he was, you know, tops in the juniors. He was always top three and 
again, you didn't, you didn't really know when he was going to make his big stride. And it was, you know, the year that he started in qualifying at Wimbledon and made it all the way to the semifinals, which again was right at that. And when he was 18, that's when my dad passed away. So I wasn't able to be in England that year. Yeah. It was, you know, it became difficult at times because yeah. there was always a lot of press, a lot of photographers, and I wasn't used to that. Yeah. For like Rocky's parents, you know, they were used to being in sort of the Hollywood lights and and having cameras around them and being asked questions. But I I really wasn't used to that, so I didn't know how to handle the press very well. Was that a hard time? Because that must have been yeah. uh, that's have been difficult going on a date or being out with your boyfriend or even just coming off of a tennis match and they're all over you with cameras. And- right, especially in England where they sort of pin this name on him as Super Brat. Oh, yeah. you know, we would would walk out of a hotel and it would be like, you know, we were just maybe going out to dinner or going to a play. And then it was just like you see other celebs that are mobbed, you know, they have to start going in the back door of certain yeah. places and, and stuff like that. And then that, how that became problematic is he would then come to Los Angeles and I'd say, hey, let's go to the grocery store. Let's go get a few things. And he'd be like, no, I'm going to wait here. Because that became a problem. He couldn't go to the grocery store. Then he was like, he was also kind of paranoid that people were going to mm. be whispering and talking about him like, oh, there's John McEnroe, you right. know. And, yeah. but here I was kind of in my hometown, so I didn't care. You know, yeah. I just wanted to go to the grocery store. So he started to get more sort of protective of his stuff. You know, he didn't want to go out as much, but he still, you know, when we went to tournaments, whether it was in France or England, I mean, we both loved food. So we yeah. loved going out to restaurants and stuff. Did he ever scream, you've got to be kidding me at you? <laughs> <laughs> well, not to me, like, not in a bad way, like not an abusive way, but you know, there was a point in time where he knew he was number one in the world and he felt like he should be given all the privileges of a number one player. Yeah. I'd give him a hard time for if he was misbehaving, you know, I didn't like it. Right. As an athlete, like how do you keep your ego in check? Yeah. Because my dad was just a very down to earth guy. I mean, he didn't, they weren't about, pretentious thought, how can I explain it? I mean, my dad was just, he was a Lieutenant in the army. So he was just like all about like, just do what's in front of you. You know, like we've got this tournament, let's practice for it. And, and don't have your mind sway any other way, but just focus on what you need to do on the court. So it sounds like it kind of that way, how that mentality kind of helped you sounds like kept you more focused without thinking, Oh, you're the greatest Right, right. No, no, I never was sort of full of myself. Yeah, he was always in admiration of the ones like Bjorn Borg, Chris Everett, Arthur Ashe. Yeah. That were always very humble. Yeah. That was one of his values. He wasn't, like I said, a pretentious guy or a boastful guy. It was an incredible, incredible value to pass on to you. Yeah, yeah. It seems like you also weren't phased by your competition. Did you ever go up against somebody and be like, oh, God, this is like my hero or this person is so amazing. I'm I'm frightened. Well, I mean, because I grew up with Tracy Austin, I was sort of she was a name. And so I was I wasn't phased by that with Tracy because I was used to playing her in juniors. But, you know, growing up watching Chris Everett and then playing her. How was that? (laughs) Yeah, with her, I got a bit nervous. I only really got to play Chrissy once in singles and once in doubles. And there was sort of this mystery about Chrissy. So that's what sort of made it, added a little more nerves to the match for me. But as opposed to when I played Martina, who I played a bunch one year, she was just more one of the gals and was willing to talk to you. You know, Chrissy was very... Yeah. I would have thought the exact opposite. Yeah, it that's seems what I would like have thought. Chris Everett's the friendly one. <laughs> Martina's Everett's been loving so much business. I would say Chrissy wasn't friendly. She was, yeah. but it was, you just felt sort of a, a little aloofness here and there where, where huh. Martina would be the one playing backgammon with you in the locker room wow. and, and mingling more uh, with you. And I, I got to know Martina a little bit more. So Martina seems so serious on the court. Yeah. Oh, she was, she was. And, and, but my game sort of matched up a little bit 
better at times with Martina than it like Chris. I was like, I was playing a mirror, you know, mm. and, uh-huh. you know, five times better at it than me. You know, <laughs> she just, you know, she just never missed. So um, I had a couple of close matches with Martina, but my match with Chrissy wasn't really all that, all that close. Now you went to 25 grand slams. Did you get to know these cities? Well, or did you just come and go? Yeah, you're pretty much going to the hotels, you're going to the practice courts, you're playing your matches and then going back. And it's only if you would have lost in the tournament that you then would get to see some sights and take in a little bit of the city. And, you know, once I was off the circuit, then I really wanted to go back to some of these places and travel (laughs) and travel and see them. But I did make a point because of John too. And we would go to museums. And uh, so if we were in Paris, you know, we'd take in the culture there. Um, his good friend, Mary Carrillo, who I was also friends with, we would all go to the Louvre together. Wow. But, you know, to then do it years later as like a married person, go back to Paris and climb the Eiffel Tower. And it's, it's different, you know, yeah, it's different. sure. Yeah when you're playing in a tournament, it's like, okay, I only got an hour, you know, to see the Louvre, you know, let <laughs> me run in and do it. <laughs> see the Mona Lisa and get out of there. Yeah. yeah I can remember seeing the Mona Lisa. Yeah. You actually, when you were young, when was the first tournament that you went to Ojai? When was the first time you went to the Ojai tournament and I, and you fell in love with Ojai, right? I was 13. And again, my brother had played it many years before. So I was used to the, you know, watching the matches, the courts, the whole environment of Ojai. So I played in the 14 and unders and, and won the first tournament I played there. So I always had this great feeling about Ojai and I stayed with the family and then played it in subsequent years and just always did really well. You won a lot. Yeah, I won a lot of the Ojais. I remember when I was 16 and I was housing with a family and the backyard of the family home laid up right against Seoul Golf Course, which is a public mm. golf course here in Ojai. And they didn't have any blinds on their or curtains in their home. And so I woke up in, in the bedroom that I was sleeping in and I would wake up early to the natural light. And I all I heard was this and it was the sprinklers on mm-hmm. the golf course. And I didn't hear anything else. Wow. And I thought, this is really cool. Like, like, where am I? <laughs> I'm not hearing any cars. And I really like this quiet. And I and I said, when I get older, I want to have a second home here. <laughs> 20 years after I said that, I was living in Ohio. Wow. What was it like to retire from tennis? How do you decide? There's so many things going on and you're so young. Right. So many variables were coming into play. I had a, a best friend on the circuit. And she had retired a year before me. She was wondering sort of why I was still sort of hanging on because at that point, my ranking in the last year or so of my tennis days had started going down. And to tell you the truth, I don't know what was keeping me going other than I couldn't say no. <laughs> you know, I just, <laughs> It's like what I knew. I didn't know what else I was going to do, but I did know that I wanted to finish school right. and I wanted to get my education. It was really important. As you guys know, coming from a Jewish family, yep. you know, mom and dad want you to finish college. So I knew that was important to me as well as my family. And so I thought, well, I'm getting injured. These injuries aren't healing well. I'm losing more. I'm losing to these youngsters that are 15 and 16. And it was my, my best friend in Florida that said, Stace, I think it's time to go hang it up and go back to school. Okay. Um, that was around age 26. And so that's when I majored in sociology and I finished in two years. Congrats. And that's great. And then did you get a job right away at the Raider Institute right after school? Yeah. You know, I worked at Raider. That was interesting to me, working with psychologists and, you know, therapists and nutritionists. That serves people with like eating disorders and drug addicts. Depression. It was depression. And then there was a unit below us in the hospital that was the drug addicts Mm. and chemical dependency users. And very often they would finish the program in that unit and then come up to the eating disorder (laughs) because they had the the cross addictions that they were dealing with. So I got just a boatload of training there. 
Yeah. I was in graduate school and was able to use what I was studying. And it sounds like a very busy time in your life. Yeah. And I was still teaching tennis on the side. Oh my gosh. And you never stopped teaching and playing tennis throughout everything, right? Yeah. I mean, tennis always weaved in my life. It sounds like very early age that you were incredibly independent and you just kept this independent streak throughout your tennis career and education. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I, I guess because I was living this lifestyle on the road and I did want to continue sort of being my own boss, making my own, creating my own life. And so even when I was working at Raider Institute, um, I was grateful that it was only a tw about 24 hours a week. Oh, good. So I always tried to have this nice balance between tennis, school, work. And yeah, I don't think I did very well with authority. <laughs> How did you make your way to Ojai? I was coming up to Ojai when I was actually with my mom when I was a teenager. When I was 19, we would come and visit the spa. One of the spas up here is called the Oaks. The Oaks. And the Oaks at Ojai. So we would sporadically come up here for a weekend. And then when I was off the tour, so say I was 26, 27, 28, the owner approached me. And uh, she said, hey, you know, we have these tennis weeks. I would love it if you would be one of our instructors. We can't pay you, but you could stay at our spa for free. All your meals and classes are being included. And I was like, great, like spa vacation, you know. Can you get a massage too? Go a massage <laughs> for me. Um, and I got to teach with this wonderful woman who's, I'm, who's still a friend of mine today. She's 80 years old. And we got kind of a following and we did it for 10 years together. Every year, because I got this, these accommodations and I was allowed to bring a guest, I would bring a girlfriend, I would bring my mom, I would bring whoever I was dating at the time. Yeah. And then when I was uh, 35 or whatever, that's when I brought Ian, who I had been dating for a year. We went on a bike ride, we went on a hike, and he said, let's move here. Ooh. Wow. We got Ian's approval, too. And I said, with you? <laughs> 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 like, live together here? And he said, yeah. And uh, I said, well, you know, I take that pretty seriously. We decided, yeah, to do it. And I couldn't think of any reason not to, other than my family was in Los Angeles. But right. that was fine. You know, it was time to move out of L.A. <laughs> Ojai is not too far. It only takes two hours from Beverly Hills. Exactly. And it just, it, it had everything that we liked, you know, the mountains, the tennis courts, um, easy living. Yeah, beautiful. We got a town home right away and, and that was it. We told my family, uh, yeah, we'll give it six months. We're going to move up to Ojai. We're going to give it six months and see what happens. But I got hooked in right away to the community. So you guys started creating this great life. What what, what was Ian like? Because you guys do rock climbing and adventures. And now you guys have a company now called Trails by Potter. Yeah. Ian had this background in rock climbing. In fact, when he said, um, you know, yeah, I'll come visit you in Ojai during your tennis clinics and all this. And, and he goes, I, I know how to get there. And I'm like, how does an Englishman know about Ojai, this little yeah. town of eight, you know, then it was like 7,000 people. And he said, oh, I, I rock climbed there. Oh, wow. And I said, oh, okay. And, but he had never really been in the town town. He'd just been rock climbing. So, yeah. And he was also had the biking background because being in England, he, mm -hmm. had, he was part of biking clubs where they would bike a hundred miles. I was just used to biking from, you know, Olympic and Pico, <laughs> Olympic and, and South Rodeo to like Rancho Park. Exactly. Was, literally sat on the curb outside and he was like, now what do I want to do? I hate my job. I've got these two bikes and, you know, what, what am I going to do? And I was working at the Oaks mm -hmm. at this point leading hikes. And I said, and doing some tennis teaching yeah. in and around Ohio. And I said, oh. Well, I'll just, again, this was one of these things. I just thought, what the heck? I got nothing to lose. Yep. I'll propose it to the owner. And she said, great, we'll do it. And so we started putting these signups for the guests and we were getting, we were getting uh movement, you know, people wow. were loving it. And we said, well, once it, you know, gets up and running, then we'll sort of drop the oaks and we'll go do our own thing. Okay. Well, 
we stayed with the Oaks for yeah. all those years. And because we loved the clients, the guests that would come to the Oaks, we, uh, we had rapport with them. We had repeat business with them. Uh-huh. And it wasn't until we took a trip, Ian and I love to travel. And so we would always take at least one or two big trips a year. And we went to New Zealand and we were staying at these B&Bs. And we thought, how do these like little places that only hold like five people, like how do they get filled up? Right. And I went to the owner and I asked them, how do you drum up business? And she goes, oh, we have a website. And I'm like, like, what's oh, that? You know, what's that? You know, again. You not- <laughs> So I said to Ian, I go, when we get home, we're going to, we're going to the internet. <laughs> then our name was out there more and uh, we started getting some traction. You know, we got all the Google stuff and that's great. It seems really like a cool company. Like I'm actually looking forward to making a trip to Ojai and booking some trips with you guys. Yay! Count me in too. I'd love to do that. Yay. Yay. So you also went back to school and you got your integrative nutrition counseling, which I yeah. am a huge fan of integrative medicine because that's the only doctor I go to is, oh, med- you know, he's an MD and integrative medicine doctor. I might know him. Dr. Hurt, H-I-R-T. He went to Beverly High with us. Oh, he's younger than oh. us. And I thought this is a perfect fit for me mm-hmm. because I had entertained the idea of going back and getting my, my PhD. But when I was looking into the price and the schooling and the, you know, the internship of getting hours again, I thought. That's a really big undertaking. I thought, I don't know if I can do that. Mm. You know, and the years it was going to take. So I thought, God, this is less than a year. And then I had this perfect funnel with working at the Oaks. Yeah, you could just kind of, you can get the degree and kind of start funneling right away into work. Right. Well, and getting the clients. Amazing. So, right. Building clients at the Oaks. Yeah, it wasn't even that I tried. It would just be, oh, I took a lady out on a bike ride and she says, oh, I'm really having a hard time, you know, getting off sugar. You know, yeah. what do you think about that? Yeah. And, so, you know, I just talk like I was just talking and she's like, you seem to know a lot about this. And I said, well, I, I you know, I'm getting certified as a yeah. blah, blah, blah. And I've got my clinical degree and blah, blah, blah. And so then she's like, God, I would love to work with you. And so then it wasn't even a matter of me trying to get clients. Yeah. It just started falling in my lap. That's great. Your relationship with the Oaks has really been amazing. Exactly. And so then through, you know, learning sort of new techniques other than what I learned in graduate school, it was this whole program of working with somebody three, four, six months at a time. Amazing. So you could really track how well people are doing instead of this short term stuff right or working in a hospital situation where it was very dire you know that they that they get healthy so the fact that i had this eating disorder training and the psychology and getting the nutrition background through the the institute of integrative nutrition it was just a perfect blend sounds like a perfect fit i gotta say stacy you sound like a very healthy athlete (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, because you hear a lot of people like their heads in the wrong place or, you know, you've seen your whole life, you know, you played so hardcore young and you found your way back through education, finding a wonderful place to live and, you know, sharing this special place with your love and have tennis coming through it always. And you, your head seems just really, I just really good head on your shoulders. Really amazing. Thank you taken a lot of work and I will say I have a very patient husband yeah. <laughs> who will put up with some of my moods but he's very down to earth funny and will help me out when when I need it you know when I need good advice wonderful when you were on the road or even now living in Ojai where are there some things that you would want to come back to Beverly Hills for that you missed past or present I have so many memories that, I mean, and and to this day, Rocky and I were talking about um, (laughs) his wife made him a chocolate souffle. I go, what'd you do on your birthday? And he goes, well, you know, Andrea made me a chocolate souffle. And he goes, and I had to tell her that, you know, we used to go and do that. And I'm like, hamburger Hamlet. Hamburger Hamlet. (laughs) I like the souffle at Moustache Cafe. Moustache. Oh, my gosh. I used to go there and then I would try to make those crepes at home, the spinach, (laughs) the chicken, 
And so when, after my dad passed away, I would cook for my mom and we, I would try to duplicate the mustache cafe. And you know, of course that was a place that, that Rocky and I frequented. I mean, I've got so many memories with my family from Will Wright's, you know, the ice yeah. cream, yep. hamburger hamlet, uh, going to the movie theater on Beverly Drive, seeing Planet of the Apes there for oh, the yeah. first time, going to the yogurt shops, you know, after school, which I didn't get to do very often because I was usually practicing. But yeah. I remember, you know, Roxbury Park. Yep, we love Roxbury Park. So many simple things that you don't see, nor can you see these days because our parents would let us go and do these things, right? Yeah. 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 If I had a match at eight o'clock in Long Beach, my dad would take me to Roxbury Park at 630 and I'd warm up against the backboard because the gates would be closed to the courts. That was my park. That was, yeah. Stacy, it was so great to have you on the show. Thank you. Love talking to you guys. You're both welcome to come up to Ojai anytime and come do tennis, go on a hike with us. We'll take you on a bike ride. We'll take you to the wineries, the olive oil farms. I love it all. I have a feeling we're going to take you up on that, Stacy. Okay. Because Ojai is one of my favorite places, too. So I have a feeling that uh, David and I will be hiking with you soon. <laughs> Thanks, Stacy. It was so good to have you on the show. Thank, Thank you. you so much. You guys were great, great questions. It was fun. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye Stacy. Welcome to the Beverly Hills Breakdown. The Beverly Hills Breakdown, our favorite time, David. That's what you always say. Well, it always is. Okay. <laughs> Margot, who was a previous guest, introduced us to Stacy Markelin Potter, and we're very thankful. Stacy's brother actually taught Margot tennis, and that's how she met Stacy. Stacy talks about her first boyfriend, Rocky Lang, and he was the son of Jennings Lang, who we discussed some of his films. He made all those disaster movies. But she also mentioned Rocky's mother, Monica Lewis. And she was famous in her own right. She was both a singer and an actress. And pretty cool. She played the voice. She did the voice of the Chiquita Banana. And she would sing that song. Uh, you can sing it. I can't sing it. <laughs> Chiquita Banana. <laughs> Chiquita <laughs> Banana. <laughs> well, I'm sure you've all heard this song, but. We'll post it online so you guys can all hear it. Especially because we found the commercial from 79. And then going back to Margot, Monica Lewis actually appeared on the first ever Ed Sullivan show. See, that's what's so fun, David, is our small world connection of Beverly Hills. From Margot, we got to Stacy. Stacy dated Rocky. Rocky's mom was a, one of the first guests on the Ed Sullivan show, the very first episode. Just kind of a small work connection in Beverly Hills. Yeah, I think all our guests are even one handshake away from each other. Exactly. We're closer than Kevin Bacon. We're closer than six degrees of separation. No, we're like zero degrees of separation. True, true. Then she discussed Carl Earn, and Carl was somebody that I knew, and certainly my grandmother and my mother knew because they both learned tennis from him. My grandmother played most of her life at Hillcrest until she was 95. Wow. My mother also learned from Carl, but she never made it to the uh, Grand Slams that Stacy did. She certainly didn't, but Vicki also Small Ward Connection was also on our show. So it's all tied in together, David. Yeah. Hillcrest was one of the two country clubs in the vicinity of Beverly Hills. We actually don't have an actual country club in Beverly Hills. We have Hillcrest, which is just south on Pico. And then we have another one next to the El Rodale Elementary School, the L.A. Country Club. In one room, you could see George Burns playing cards with Groucho Marx. And in another room, you could see Don Rickles eating dinner with Bob Newhart. How fun. Very cool. And now Stacy's living in Ojai. Ojai's this cute little mountain town cruising up on the mountains. It's a one town street, like with a main street and these awesome spas and beautiful shops and hiking and biking and just the most gorgeous place to live. It's about two hours from Los Angeles. Yeah, it doesn't take you very long from Los Angeles to kind of feel like you're in a completely different environment away from the hustle and bustle. And certainly Ojai has that very natural feel with mountains and hiking. 
Well, it was so fun having Stacy on the show, and we hope you all enjoy, and we look forward to catching up with you guys soon. Please like us on Facebook and Instagram. Subscribe. We're all, everywhere podcasts are, on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, Google. Come and find us and help us grow our fabulous show. Give us a rating and subscribe. Yay! We'll talk to you next time. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Suicide has personally affected my life. If you or anyone you know is struggling or having a hard time, there is help out there. Please reach out to the Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255.